Hi, it's Katrina. Ancient SOS Letter Over 3,000 years ago, the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II received an SOS message on a clay tablet from the Queen of the Hittites, who ruled in what is now Turkey, stating, I have no grain in my lands. The two kingdoms, which previously warred with one another, were undergoing a severe drought that was destroying crops and killing cattle and humans. As it turns out, the Egyptians were evidently better planners than the Hittites. They foresaw the crisis and stored food in anticipation of it, even sending some to their former enemies to help them get through the trying time. The clay tablet containing the message begging for help tipped experts off to the severity of this dark period of ancient history. Campbell Price from the Manchester Museum told the Daily Express, The drought, as far as we know, lasts 150 years, and it brings once great empires to their knees because of the lack of food. Long story short, long-standing enemies were weakened to the point of helping one another survive. But the Egyptians' willingness to help the Hittites, as well as their capability to do so, baffled experts. All signs point toward the civilization being able to predict and prepare for droughts. Exactly how they did this was a mystery until relatively recently, when carbon isotope data revealed that Egyptian commoners survived mostly on grains, such as wheat and barley, while the elite enjoyed a more protein-rich diet. Simply put, at the time the society was mostly vegetarian, and their large focus on grain production enabled them to help out their neighbors when times got tough. Even the neighbors they hated. Mogao Caves The Mogao Caves, also called the Caves of the Thousand Buddhas, are what they sound like, a series of hundreds of hand-carved caves containing thousands of Buddha depictions on the walls and ceilings, as well as over 2,000 brightly painted sculptures of Buddha and other figures. From the 4th to the 14th centuries, the caves were carved out of rock facing the oasis town of Dunhuang, which sits at the edge of the Gobi Desert in northwestern China. Local officials, Buddhist monks, and wealthy families sponsored the project, which saw the caves filled with the world's largest collection of Buddhist artwork. Legend holds that a monk named Yue Zun envisioned a thousand Buddhas adorning the rock face, inspiring him to begin excavating in 366 AD, over 1,650 years ago. The cave's artwork reflects a melting pot of cultures, owing to the site's location along the ancient Silk Road trading route, which linked Europe, Central Asia, and China for centuries. Inside, there are documents from multiple religions, including Christianity, Taoism, and Confucianism, and in many languages, including Chinese, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Old Turkish, and even Hebrew. After the Silk Road fell into disuse during the 15th century, the Mogao Caves were more or less forgotten. It wasn't until 1890 that a Taoist monk named Wang Yuanlu became the self-proclaimed guardian of the caves, where he uncovered a cache of 50,000 valuable manuscripts, textiles, banners, and paintings inside a sealed cavern. The items all dated back to before the year 1000, and it's unknown why someone took the time and effort to store and conceal the items. But it's good that they did, because the artifacts constitute one of the greatest document collections in history. Lost Dragon City In 2017, a team of archaeologists working in central Mongolia made some seemingly important discoveries near the banks of the River Orkhon in the country's Arkhangai province. But a lack of funding prevented the experts from exploring further and forced them to put the dig on hold. Believing they had found evidence of loot or Luncheng, a fabled dragon city that once served as the capital of a mysterious civilization called the Qiangnu Empire, they returned this year to continue their work as quietly as possible. One of the most telling finds is a roof decoration fragment inscribed with the saying, Son of Heaven Chan Yu. Son of Heaven is a title of imperial Chinese origin dating all the way back to the Zhu dynasty, which lasted from 1046 to 256 BC. It was used to legitimize a leader's rule. Meanwhile, Chan Yu was the term given to the leader of the Qiangnu Empire, and its presence on the artifact suggests that the site is connected with the little studied society. This is the first time that an object with such an inscription has been discovered. Archaeologist Tumor Ochir Idir Kangai, who led the dig, told Sputnik News. The vast empire of the nomadic Qiangnu people spread throughout Asia and lasted from 300 BC to 100 AD. They were often victorious in battles against the Chinese and forced the defeated to pay tribute afterward. Despite their former glory, the ethnicity, origin, and other imperative details of the Qiangnu are largely a mystery to researchers. And until recently, the location of their capital city was included among the many questions experts have about the civilization. Although it looks as though this particular mystery may now be solved. 
offering table of DEFG. Little is known about the 165-pound alabaster tablet known as the offering table of DEFG, which measures 19.3 inches in diameter and 5 inches thick. This rare ancient Egyptian artifact is remarkable for numerous reasons, namely its round shape, as most of the civilization's offering tables were rectangular, according to the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden, Netherlands, which houses the object. It dates back to Egypt's sixth dynasty between 2,323 and 2,150 BC, and is inscribed with hieroglyphics which describe Defji as the unique friend of the palace. The word sacrifice also appears in the inscriptions. Three-dimensional elements in the form of reliefs of bowls, lidded vases, and an ointment palette cover the tabletop. There are numerous compartments designated for different purifying agents, dishes, and drinks. Seven shallow cavities across the top of the table are meant for various oils, including festive ointment, laudation oil, balm, nakhenim oil, tuawet oil, top-quality cedar oil, and top-quality Libyan oil. Clearly, they were super into their essential oils. An inscription to the right of each bowl dictates that the contents are for Defji. Who or what was this mysterious Defji? Beyond the observations I told you, much of its context remains a mystery. Kangaroo Island Log In what appears to be a woefully boring discovery at first glance, archaeologists working on Australia's Kangaroo Island unearthed a mysterious log in 2016. Subsequent ground-penetrating radar data revealed the possible presence of more buried logs, further deepening the mystery and indicating that a former shipyard may exist at the site. Found buried next to the American River, the original log in question measures nearly 2 feet in diameter and 15.7 feet long. We know it is a type of log that was used for early wooden boat building, and this log was clearly cut down by axe, Rebuild Independence Group Secretary David Cohens told the Wellington Times. But here the mystery thickens. It has a step, or notch, cut at exactly mid-length on the top surface, in which a flat stone had been embedded with tar. While conducting a ground-penetrating radar survey of the beach in 2018 and noticing several log-shaped items, Dr. Ian Moffat of Flinders University also detected several graves. A team from the university is currently exploring the site to try getting to the bottom of what once stood there and who built it. Iron Age Mystery Murder Victim In mid-July of this year, the 2,000-year-old skeletal remains of a man who met a violent end were discovered face down at a site called Wellwick Farm in Buckinghamshire, England. Archaeologists working for the UK's HS2 high-speed rail project made the gruesome find, along with numerous other significant artifacts, including a Stonehenge-like wooden formation, a Roman burial, an Iron Age coin and funerary monument, and other objects dating from the Neolithic Age to the medieval period. Altogether, the discoveries span roughly 4,000 years of human activity in the area. From the Bronze to the Iron Ages, the site appears to have been used for domestic activity. During the Neolithic and Roman times, it seems to have held ritual significance of varying types. The artifacts provided experts with a glimpse into what daily life was like for the site's inhabitants over the centuries. But one discovery, the Iron Age skeleton of a man who met his untimely end in an apparently brutal way, continues to perplex researchers. The death of the Wellwick farm man remains a mystery to us, but there aren't many ways you end up in a bottom of a ditch, face down with your hands bound, project archaeologist Dr. Rachel Wood told the BBC. Further tests are being carried out to try getting to the bottom of the nameless individual's story. Egyptian anchor while swimming off the coast of Atlit in January 2018, an Israeli veterinarian named Rafi Bahalul spotted a heavy trapezoidal stone object with a hole at the top and rounded corners. The artifact was covered in hieroglyphics and ornaments, prompting the man to swim deeper to get a closer look and to touch the item. It was like entering an Egyptian temple at the bottom of the Mediterranean, Bahalul told Haaretz. He contacted the Israel Antiquities Authority and informed them of the discovery. As it turns out, archaeologists were already familiar with the site where Bahalul made the incredible find, as other artifacts had been uncovered there in the past. The item in question, a 3,400-year-old anchor, was made from second-hand stone that was originally used for an important building of some sort in Egypt, perhaps a palace or a temple. Included among its engravings is a portrait of Seshat, the goddess of writing. The anchor was featured at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem as part of an exhibit called Emoglyphs, picture writing from hieroglyphs to the emoji. That's
that sounds like fun. Phoenix Button During a typical leisurely outing with friends and fellow metal detector enthusiasts at a public beach along Puget Sound in Washington State, a tugboat worker named Phil Massey discovered a brass button unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Measuring less than an inch in diameter, the button was buried about six inches underground, and the small item was nearly missed by Massey, who had found nothing of value throughout the day's search, and was nearly ready to give up and relocate to another area to resume his metal detecting. Massey cleaned off the dirt-encrusted button, revealing an image of a phoenix bird, along with a French saying that he later learned translates to, I am reborn from my ashes. The perplexed amateur explorer's photo of the button was examined by archaeologist Doug Wilson from the National Park Service, who works at the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. What amounted to a huge mystery for Massey, who was unsure of what the object was, turned out to be nothing new for Wilson, who has observed several such phoenix buttons throughout the Pacific Northwest over the years. Wilson explained the meaning of the French slogan as well as a number on the button, which is used for identifying regiments of the Haitian military under King Christophe, a former slave who led the successful slave rebellion that eventually achieved Haiti's freedom. An estimated 1,000 or more phoenix buttons have appeared in the region, but for a long time, researchers wondered exactly how they got there. One theory asserts that the buttons were manufactured in London for use in the Haitian military. But after King Christophe died in 1820, they were likely sold to an American man named Nathaniel Wyeth, who brought his goods to the region around 190 years ago, looking to trade with Native Americans. While this is the most likely scenario, it hasn't been proven, leaving the slim possibility that the buttons made their way to the Pacific Northwest some other way. Gosh, you never know what you might find with a metal detector. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon The definitive locations of six out of the original seven wonders of the world have been established, but the whereabouts of the famed Hanging Gardens of Babylon remains a long-standing mystery that seems like it may never be solved. A Greek engineer named Philo compiled the list around 225 BC, and while only the pyramids of Giza still stand today, documentary and archaeological evidence has helped to identify identify where five of the others once stood. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon are a different story entirely. Believed to be the creation of King Nebuchadnezzar II, the enigmatic landmark continues to escape archaeologists who search tirelessly for any sign of it. There are no ruins and no known Babylonian references connected with the gardens, which represent the only destination on Philo's list located outside of the eastern Mediterranean, rather than directly in or near it. Philo wrote about the exotic site, which reportedly contained a vast array of trees and flowers set atop a platform of palm beams raised on stone columns, a century after Babylon was conquered by Alexander the Great. He also described a sophisticated irrigation system that kept the plants watered in the dry desert heat, writing, water, collected on high and numerous ample containers, reaches the whole garden. Classical writers, including 1st century BC geographer Strabo, described the gardens as a wonder according to National Geographic. Historian Diodorus Siculus compiled the most thorough description of the site, which he incorporated into his Bibliotheca Historica, a 40-volume account of world history. Diodorus's account was similar to Philo's, lending credibility to the gardens truly having existed at some point. As experts search for the site to no avail, some have started wondering if the Hanging Gardens were located somewhere other than Babylon, another city perhaps. After all, it's not unheard of for Greco-Roman accounts of Mesopotamian civilizations to confuse Assyria and Babylonia, for example. Stephanie Daly, an Assyriologist at Oxford University, made the bold assertion that the Hanging Gardens not only weren't in Babylon, but also were not commissioned by King Nebuchadnezzar II. Instead, she suggests that the Assyrian king Sennacherib built the fabled structures in Nineveh, where ruins potentially qualifying as the site have been found. But for now, this remains unproven proven, leaving researchers no choice but to continue their quest for answers. Strange Stone Face Last year, a worker plowing a field in Newton Grove, North Carolina, discovered a very strange object without even realizing it. He hit a stone with the plow, so he picked it up and placed it at the edge of the field to get it out of the way. When the landowner, Tom Giddens, walked by the area, he happened to flip the stone over and saw that there was a face on it. Archaeologist Mary Beth Fitz, who works with the Office of State Archaeology as assistant state archaeologist, was very surprised by the find. As a 20-year veteran, she wanted to understand more about the face carved on the stone. In an attempt to get to the bottom of the situation, she created a 3D model of the sculpture and posted photographs of it on social media, appealing to the public for any information they may have about its origins. It really is mysterious, she said. We don't know what time period it's from, and it could be a piece of folk art, or it could have been made a long time ago. 
It's made of sandstone and that's a pretty soft stone. So you don't need special tools to carve sandstone. So that means it really could have been carved any time in history. When do you think it's from? Any guesses of who might have made it? Let me know in the comments below. Bronze Age Gold in Denmark. In 2015, archaeologists uncovered a cache of 2,000 Bronze Age gold spirals in a field on the Danish island of Zealand. While the site is a hotspot for Bronze Age artifacts, experts are stumped about what the thin, inch-long coils were used for, or what they even really are in the first place. They weren't the first gold spirals ever to be discovered, as others have been found in Germany and similar bronze coils have turned up in Poland but they are the first such artifacts to appear in Denmark, and their purpose remains a long-standing mystery. Given the abundance of gold in the area, researchers speculate that the spirals, which date back between 900 and 700 BC, may have had ritual significance. Several other items made from gold, including rings, bracelets, and cups, have been unearthed over the last two centuries. Kirsten Christensen, an archaeologist with the West Zealand Museum, theorized shortly after the discovery that the coils originate from a time when the region's inhabitants worshipped the sun. They were found near a series of wooden and fur fragments that once probably made up a box that they were kept in. Further excavations are planned in hopes of uncovering more treasure, but the spirals still lack a definitive explanation. Patom Crater Prior to 1949, only a few locals knew about a bizarre, otherworldly crater in Siberia that they called the Fire Eagle's Nest. Believing that the crater was a dark and evil place, they avoided going near it, and they even believed that animals avoided going near it as well. People had reasons for their superstitions, including numerous disappearances that had happened when people went near the crater and were never heard from again. Located in the Irkutsk region, the 131-foot-high, 328-foot-wide structure looks like a giant speaker from an aerial view. A Russian geologist named Vadim Kolpakov was the first scientist to encounter the Patom crater, as it came to be commonly known. At first glance, he was baffled, wondering if he had discovered an archaeological artifact, but also knowing that this was unlikely, as the ancient peoples of the region did not build rock pyramids. Upon closer examination, it became evident that the mound, measuring roughly 525 feet in diameter, is made of shattered limestone. Theories abounded about the crater's origins, including the possibility of a meteor having fallen on the site, and speculations about an alien ship having landed there and a nuclear reaction having occurred underground. Due to a lack of funding, the site was not thoroughly explored until the early 2000s, when scientists ruled out the more outrageous theories and even some of the rational ones, eventually concluding that a steam explosion had caused the crater to form around 500 years ago. Of course, not everyone is satisfied with this explanation, especially conspiracy theorists, who are adamant that some far more exciting event led to the crater's creation. Additionally, scientists cannot explain the strange events that have happened near the mound. Roman Holy Jar Found shattered into 180 pieces in a storage room at the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, an otherwise ordinary-looking jar dating back to when Romans ruled London is riddled with tiny holes, leaving experts stumped regarding what it was used for. The 1,800-year-old 16-inch-tall vessel is unlike any other identified artifact from the Roman world. We've been sending it around to all sorts of Roman pottery experts and other pottery experts, and no one seems to be able to come up with an example, Katie Urban, a researcher at the London Ontario Museum, told Life Science in 2011. Researchers speculate that the jar may have held dormice, which ancient texts suggest that the Romans enjoyed snacking on, that it could have been a lamp, or that it was used for containing snakes. But much like the vessel itself, no one really knows what the heck it was for. During the 1950s, an archaeologist named William Francis Grimes gifted numerous artifacts from Roman-era Britain, which lasted from 43 to 410 AD, to the museum. Urban explained that the jar may have come from this collection, but admitted that it's not entirely known how it fell into the museum's hands. There are many possibilities as to what the jar's purpose was, and as Urban puts it, it's anyone's guess. What's your guess? Let me know in the comments! Humpback Whale Supergroups in a 2017 study, perplexed scientists reported observations of humpback whales, normally a solitary species, gathering off the South African coast in tightly knit supergroups, 
numbering as many as 200. Over the course of three research cruises during spring of 2011, 2014, and 2015, marine biologist and study leader Ken Findlay and the team of researchers witnessed three such gatherings of humpback whales. These are animals that normally are in groups of up to maybe three or four, Finlay told National Geographic. To see 200 together in an area the size of a football field is remarkable. The time of year made things even more confusing, as humpback whales typically only migrate to South Africa's cold waters during winter to feed. One theory posits that the whales found abundant food in these waters and simply decided to stay there instead of migrate. It's also possible that the species is thriving as it recovers from an era of whaling that nearly wiped it out, and scientists are noticing normal humpback whale behaviors that were less apparent at lower numbers. Ancient Bronze Artifact in Alaska In 2011, archaeologists unearthed a bronze buckle-like object in an ancient Inuit dwelling in Alaska. A small piece of leather wrapped around the artifact was radiocarbon dated back to 600 AD. And while this may not reflect the age of the buckle itself, it presented scientists with a quandary, as bronze was not manufactured or commonly used in Alaska at that time. Moreover, the item predated the home it was found in by several hundred years, according to John Hoffaker, who led the excavation. Measuring roughly 2 inches by 1 inch, the buckle-like object was discovered in a 1,000-year-old dwelling. Researchers theorized that it may have originated in East Asia before traveling to Alaska via the Bering Land Bridge that once connected Siberia and North America. If this is indeed the case, the object may have been used as a harness or a horse ornament back in Asia and as a clasp for clothing or as shaman's regalia after reaching Alaska. But experts do not know for sure what the item was used for on either continent, how it got to North America, or exactly where it came from. The buckle represents what's known as an out-of-place artifact, or upart, an artifact that does not fit with the time and or place it is connected with. Russia's Dancing Forest The Curonian Spit is a narrow sliver of land straddling the border between Lithuania and the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad. It's home to sandy beaches, a memorial dedicated to German philosopher Immanuel Kant, and hundreds of species of flora and fauna. Perhaps the most unique attribute of the Curonian Spit is a patch of oddly twisted trees nicknamed the Dancing Forest. Planted during the 1960s to stabilize the spit's giant dunes, the distorted trees take the shapes of corkscrews, rings, and other strange forms. There is both a scientific and a folk version of why this happens. While researchers are admittedly unsure of what causes the tree's distortion, of course they have a theory. Irina, a senior ecologist at the Curonian Spit National Park, explained to the Daily Telegraph, the curvature could be caused by pine shoot moth caterpillar larvae, which, when the tree was a sapling, damaged its stem and ate the apical buds, making the tree's trunk distort. The far more abstract folk theory proposes that the dancing forest follows the movement of the sands, or as one version of the story holds, a prince encountered a beautiful girl in the forest playing the lyre. He proposed to her and she agreed to marry him if he converted to Christianity. As a compromise, the prince asked the young lady to show him the power of her god. She resumed playing her lyre and the trees began to dance. Roman Coins Found in Japan In 2013, ancient Roman coins dating back between the 3rd and 4th centuries were discovered among the ruins of Katsuren Castle in Okinawa, Japan. An X-ray analysis showed that at least one of the four copper coins, which measure between 0.6 and 0.8 inches in diameter, bear Constantine's image, while another depicts a helmeted soldier holding a shield in one hand and using the other hand to stab an enemy with a spear. The local education board, which was in charge of the excavation, noted to the Japan Times that the discovery likely pointed to the region's thriving trade with Southeast Asia and other parts of the world at the time. An Ottoman-era coin from 1687 was also found at the site, an unusual find, but it fits somewhat more appropriately with the time when the medieval castle flourished than the Roman coins do. This was the first and only known time when Roman coins were discovered in Japan, making the find truly remarkable. Moreover, experts have yet to establish exactly how and why the coins traveled to where they were buried. Ancient Carvings in Jerusalem While excavating a series of rooms carved into the bedrock in the oldest part of Jerusalem, Israeli archaeologists came across three V-shaped carvings cut into a limestone floor. Measuring roughly 2 inches deep and 20 inches long, the mysterious engravings perplexed experts who have little to go on in terms of figuring out who made them and why. In fact, knowledge surrounding the carvings is so limited, researchers have yet to even form a remotely solid theory about their origins. 
The complex that the V-shaped engravings were found in are part of a dig site called the City of David in East Jerusalem, near the Gihon Spring, the city's only natural water source. The carvings date back at least 2,800 years to around 800 BC, and so far, archaeologists speculate that they could have held a wooden structure at one time, or perhaps that they held ritual significance of some sort. But nobody, including experts with decades of experience, has been able to pinpoint a likely theory. The rooms were probably last used when Judean kings ruled Jerusalem, before being filled in with rubble to support a defensive wall. Exactly when the complex was originally built, whether it was around that time or hundreds of years earlier, when Canaanites inhabited the area, remains unknown. Whoever built the rooms did so using advanced engineering practices for the time. Coupled with the site's location next to the city's only spring, this suggests that the structure was important in some way. The Stargate Carving The Sakwala Chakraya, informally known as the Stargate Carving, is a strange map-like chart carved into a stone wall at Ranmasu Uyana, a 40-acre park in Sri Lanka containing ancient sacred gardens from the pre-Christian era. Many believe the carving contains the secret code for accessing a Stargate, a portal between Earth and outer space, which humans use for traveling to other parts of the universe and communicating with intelligent beings, according to Sri Lanka's tourism website. There are four seats facing the chart, suggesting that four people could utilize it simultaneously. Some people associated the discovery of the Sakwala Chakraya with other known stargates throughout the world, including charts found in Egypt and Peru. All three carvings were found near waterways amid structures that were built using advanced engineering methods, causing many to see connections where they may or may not exist. One prevailing theory among those with big imaginations is that the stargates were used by aliens who visited Earth to mine gold. Supporters of this idea believe that nearby architectural features, including channels, tunnels, filters, and reservoirs, represent evidence of sophisticated planning done by extraterrestrials thousands of years ago. Not surprisingly, archaeologists are quick to dismiss these theories, instead sticking to more rational thought processes such as the notion that the engravings are simply maps of the Earth, or early Buddhist charts. These carvings also may depict animal evolution, or may have been used for meditation. Modern-day experts reject the idea that ancient Sri Lankan and Egyptian civilizations had anything to do with each other, instead arguing that there were two separate societies free from one another's influence. Regardless of what anyone believes, at the end of the day, nobody knows what the Sakwala Chakraya stands for or how it was used. Mammoth Bone Circle Roughly 310 miles south of what is now Moscow, near the modern village of Kostenki, is a large circular structure containing the bones of at least 60 woolly mammoths, along with the remains of other animals, including reindeer, horses, bears, wolves, and foxes. Measuring 40 feet in diameter, the structure dates back to around 25,000 years ago, a time when our Paleolithic ancestors were going through an ice age. Exactly why ancient people built the mysterious circle and others like it that have been found nearby is unknown. They likely sourced the bones from animal graveyards, according to researchers who published a study on the matter earlier this year. Charred wood and soft plant remains at the site suggest that people burned wood and bones for fuel and that they foraged for edible plants amid the frigid climate that dominated the landscape at the time. One theory for their chosen location for the structure is that it may have contained a freshwater spring that offered liquid drinking water, which was hard to come by in the frozen environment. Nevertheless, sites like this are helping archaeologists better understand how humans survived the bitter cold of an ice age without the modern conveniences that we would be able to rely on like heating, electricity, and running water. Hard to even imagine that now, although the way 2020 is going, the beginning of an ice age wouldn't even surprise me anymore. 7th Century Shipwreck A 7th century shipwreck discovered off the coast of Israel in 2015 is offering researchers new insights into what life was like in the region amid a transition from Byzantine to Islamic rule. The 82-foot-long vessel sank 1,300 years ago, taking with it a cargo consisting of 103 amphorae filled with agricultural products and daily objects, including artifacts bearing Greek and Arabic inscriptions, as well as both Christian and Muslim symbols. Six different types of amphorae were unearthed, including two types that had never before been excavated. While most of the amphorae appeared to come from Egypt, the newly discovered types are largely shrouded in mystery. Inside the containers were olives, dates, figs, 
fish bones, pine nuts, grapes, raisins, and more, according to the Jerusalem Post. These findings challenge the commonly held belief among scholars that this transitional period in history was marked by slowed commerce in the eastern Mediterranean. People still want their luxury items no matter what, even if it takes months to get them. No human remains were found, but the ship sank pretty close to shore, leading researchers to believe that its crew survived. Much of the ship is still waiting to be excavated, including the captain's quarters, which is where the most valuable items were kept. Arsuf Battle Site The Battle of Arsuf was an iconic fight during the Third Crusade, during which Christian forces led by Richard I of England, also known as Richard the Lionheart, defeated the troops of a man best known as Saladin, or An Nasir Salah ad Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, in the year 1191. Until recently, the location of this battle, which occurred over 800 years ago, was completely lost to history. Using a combination of historical records, archaeology, and innovative techniques, Israeli archaeologist Dr. Raphael Lewis pinpointed a specific area where he believes the Battle of Arsuf took place. In describing the complicated nature of this task, Dr. Lewis told the Jerusalem Post, in most cases, the discipline considers prolonged periods of decades, if not centuries. However, the area of battlefield archaeology focuses on events that lasted only a few hours, or at most a few days, whose sites are therefore challenging to investigate archaeologically. That's a really good point. Where historical and archaeological evidence lacked, environmental data helped Dr. Lewis fill in the gaps necessary to determine where the Battle of Arsuf occurred. He analyzed factors such as the number of daylight hours available to traveling soldiers, as well as temperature, humidity, the direction of the wind, and when the sun rose high enough to be out of archers' eyes. These conditions, along with the landscape of the time, as well as the roads, enabled Lewis to conclude that Saladin's troops mistakenly believed that Richard I's army was marching inland toward Jerusalem, instead of toward Jaffa, putting the Christian forces in an advantageous position for winning the battle. Artifacts uncovered from this suspected battle site, which were recovered during the final stages of research, coincide with Lewis's theory regarding where it occurred. As far as the victory for Richard I's forces go, it epitomized the saying about how someone may have won the battle, but lost the war. Richard won the battle but failed to destroy the Muslim forces, Lewis explained. The Crusaders never managed to reconquer Jerusalem, which was their ultimate goal. Golden Cannonball In early 2019, a 22-year-old fossil hunter and medical student named Aaron Smith discovered a so-called golden cannonball with a 185-million-year-old fossil inside of it. The young man was exploring Sandsend Beach in Yorkshire, England, when he spotted the curious pyrite-coated object. Based on its glossy appearance and his experience as a seasoned fossil collector, Mr. Smith suspected the item may contain a fossil. And not surprisingly, he was right! In video footage that went viral, he can be seen opening up the stone, revealing a spiral-shaped fossil before closing it back up. Nicknamed cannonballs, pyritic concretions are typically found among shale, and they are common along the Yorkshire coastline, according to the Daily Mail. The creature encapsulated in the fossil Mr. Smith found hails from the Cleviceras genus, which went extinct during the Jurassic period. These specimens are frequently discovered, owing to the tendency for limestone to perfectly preserve them, unlike today's cephalopods, which are rarely discovered in fossilized form due to their lack of a hard shell. It still impresses me that these 185-million-year-old fossils are along our beautiful Yorkshire coastline waiting to be found, Smith said in a widely circulated video of himself opening up the golden cannonball. The creature featured in Smith's fossil is an ammonite, an ancient creature that boasted a ribbed, spiral-formed shell and thrived on Earth between 240 and 65 million years ago. Fossils of ammonites are frequently discovered, especially along the Jurassic Coast, where Smith found the artifact in question. However common, these beings are nevertheless fascinating. Have you ever found a fossil? Let me know in the comments below! $50 million shipwreck treasure in what's been nicknamed a Garden of Gold, archaeologists recently discovered a hoard of nearly $50 million worth of gold in a 150-year-old shipwreck off the North Carolina coast. The SS Central America was laden with gold bars, coins, and dust when it set sail from Panama during the heyday of the California Gold Rush, only to encounter a hurricane in the Atlantic on September 12, 1857, when it sank to the sea floor, coming to rest 8,000 feet below the water surface and around 160 miles from the Carolina shore. A team led by chief scientist Bob Evans discovered the wreck in 1988, and it's been no secret in recent years that some of the vessel's extremely valuable booty was recovered. 
but the full extent of the ship's treasures remained undisclosed until somewhat recently. News recently broke detailing the vast trove of wealth archaeologists found aboard the SS Central America, including 3,100 gold coins, 45 gold bars, and over 79 pounds of gold dust. Evans cleaned the gold piece by piece, according to the Daily Express, remarking in 2018, this is a whole new season of discovery. We are now peering beneath the grime and the rust that is on the coins, removing those objects and those substances, and getting to look at the treasure as it was in 1857. One coin alone carried an estimated sale price of up to $1 million, according to Dwight Manley of the California Gold Marketing Group. The recovery of the gold hoard was possible thanks to a remote-operated vehicle, which scooped up the booty following the shipwreck's discovery. Clues to Pharaoh's Missing Tomb Earlier this year, Egyptologists announced the discovery of an ancient chest, a little less than 3,500 years old, in the Deir el-Bahari complex of mortuary temples and tombs across the Nile from the city of Luxor. One of the artifacts that was unearthed with the stone chest bore the inscription of Tutmos II, a pharaoh whose tomb remains undiscovered to this day at a location that thus far evades historians and other experts. The artifact in question is a ceramic box, which was found enclosed within a larger wooden box and bundled in four layers of linen canvas. The ceramic box is covered in numerous hieroglyphs, including one of Tutmos II's several names, offering a clue to the identity of the owner of the so-called royal deposit. Tutmos II was the husband and stepbrother of Hatshepsut, the so-called queen who would be king. He died during his teens after ruling for just three years, from 1482 to 1479 BC, during Egypt's 18th dynasty. Experts believe the inscription on the ceramic box bearing his name, which was found near Hatshepsut's tomb, can possibly help lead them to his tomb. Finding this deposit indicates that we are in the process of discovering the tomb. Andrei Nowinski, a professor at the Institute of Archaeology at the University of Warsaw, says that they are very close. What comes next remains to be seen. Clay Figures of God In what undoubtedly amounts to one of this year's most controversial archaeological finds, a professor named Josef Garfinkel, not to be confused with Simon Garfunkel, recently asserted that a handful of 3,000-year-old male clay figurines represent the depictions of the face of God, or Yahweh. The figurines, which were found in ancient places of worship, depict a bearded man with a flattened head, wearing a crown and with ear holes, and were discovered alongside small horse statues. Citing Bible scriptures about God riding a horse, Garfinkel argued his case, only to meet backlash from fellow archaeologists who claimed that the time period during which the artifacts were crafted aligns with a policy against creating anything that is in heaven above. Instead, these opposing experts argue, the heads represent various gods rather than just Yahweh himself. They even went as far as to accuse Garfinkel of catering to popular, money-generating demand and referring to his identification of the heads as unfounded and, at best, tentative. Despite widespread criticism, Garfinkel remains true to his alleged Bible-based claims. In his words to the Daily Mail, like every discovery, some will accept and some will reject. 500-year-old shipwreck in perfect condition In late July of this year, archaeologists found a 500-year-old shipwreck in the Baltic Sea, off the Swedish coast, with its hull intact and its mast still in place, as if time had stood perfectly still since the vessel sank. Experts have referred to it as probably the best preserved shipwreck of its period to be discovered in recent times. The vessel, which was first detected in 2009 by the Swedish Maritime Administration, has the Baltic Sea's cold, salty waters to thank for its remarkable state of preservation. Perfect conditions! Maritime archaeologist and deep-sea archaeological expert Dr. Rodrigo Pacheco Ruiz explained this ship is contemporary to the times of Christopher Columbus and Leonardo da Vinci, yet it demonstrates a remarkable level of preservation after 500 years at the bottom of the sea, thanks to the cold, brackish waters of the Baltic. He said that it's almost like it sank yesterday, mass in place and hull intact. Still on the main deck is an incredibly rare find, the tender boat used to ferry crew to and from the ship leaning against the main mast. It's truly an astonishing sight. Nobody knows why the ship sank, but various theories have been entertained, including the possibilities that disease killed the crew or that they abandoned the vessel for whatever reason they deemed appropriate back in the day. Bronze Age Shield in what's been hailed as one of the UK's most important archaeological discoveries of all time, scientists recently announced the discovery of a 2,200-year-old tomb belonging to an Iron Age warrior who passed away in his 40s. 
The team, which was led by archaeologist Paula Ware, discovered the grave near Pocklington, England in late 2018. During a routine excavation, they were performing at a site where new houses were going to be built. Inside the burial were a 30-inch bronze shield, a chariot, a fork attached to the remains of a pork rib, two small brooches, one made of glass and one made from bronze, and the remains of two horses who appeared to be deliberately posed in a leaping stance. The shield is particularly fascinating, bearing intricate swirls and a protruding sphere in its center. In an interview with Live Science, Ware explained that the tomb's occupant was likely a significant member of society. While it's not uncommon to find chariots in ancient burials, the tomb is hailed as a major discovery, largely due to its remarkable state of preservation. These types of graves are most frequently discovered in modern-day Bulgaria, where the practice of burying warriors with their chariots was especially common during the Roman period. Skull Helmets At an archaeological site called Salango on the central Ecuadorian coast between 2014 and 2016, scientists discovered a 2,100-year-old grave containing the remains of nine people, including two infants who were wearing helmets made from older children's skulls. The eerie discovery is the only known instance of children's skulls being used as helmets, according to a study which was published in the journal Latin American Antiquity. Along with the human remains, the tomb contained ancestral stone figurines, which were likely meant to protect the grave's occupants in the afterlife. Researchers are unsure of the infants' and young children's causes of death, but they believe that the tightly fitted helmets still had flesh on them when they were placed on the baby's heads. Additionally, a bone called a hand phalanx was found wedged between one infant's head and their helmet, and archaeologists are at a loss to explain why or who the bone belonged to. There is no other discovery like this anywhere on Earth, and scientists are wondering if perhaps the children were related. DNA tests and other analysis will hopefully provide further insight into the bizarre burial, including who the bones belong to and why these skull helmets were affixed to the baby's heads. It was most likely a unique infant mortuary ritual of some sort, but it is unclear why these people did this. Whale Death In mid-2018, a pilot whale was discovered clinging to life in a canal in southern Thailand. Rescuers shielded the creature from the sun and used buoys to keep him afloat as he vomited plastic bags. Then, a veterinary team desperately scrambled to save the whale's life, but their efforts unfortunately failed. An autopsy revealed that there were at least 80 plastic bags in the mammal's stomach, weighing as much as 18 pounds. Marine biologist Ton Tamrong Nawasawat told The Guardian that the massive collection of plastic made it impossible for the whale to consume enough nutritious food. If you have 80 plastic bags in your stomach, you die, he explained in cut and dry terms. Tan went on to point out that plastic consumption kills at least 390 mammals annually in Thai waters, and that Thailand is one of the world's largest users of plastic bags. It's a huge problem, he said. We use a lot of plastic. But this problem is not limited to Thailand. It's worldwide, as evidenced by the increasing number of whales in recent years who have turned up dead with massive amounts of plastic in their stomachs. And while using plastic bags may seem like an inconsequential and harmless habit, Tragedies like this demonstrate what a big difference we can collectively make through small changes, like switching to reusable bags. Misshapen Mae West Two decades ago in New Orleans, Louisiana, someone discovered a snapping turtle in a drainage ditch with a milk jug ring around her midsection, which had caused her body to deform into a figure eight shape. They took the turtle into their care, freed her from the milk jug ring, and named her Mae West. Eventually, however, the handler could no longer care for Mae West, and she was relocated to the Star Eco Station in Los Angeles, California, where she resides today. It's unclear how long the milk jug ring was attached to her before she was rescued. Images of Mae West went viral in 2008, and Oprah Winfrey even used a photo of the turtle in her 2009 Earth Day report. But this is just one example of an all-too-common problem today's turtles face at the hands of plastic pollutants, and it's been happening for a long time. In 1993, for example, a red-eared slider turtle named Peanut was found trapped in a six-pack plastic ring in Missouri. Peanut's rescuers removed the plastic ring from his midsection and rehabilitated him at a zoo. Now in his 30s, Peanut has lived a long and healthy life that would simply not be possible without human help, and he remains under professional care. After hearing stories like this, you can't help but wonder how many turtles go unrescued, suffering slowly in the grip of constricting plastic. And not just turtles either, but all kinds of animals that might not make it. Confused Hermit Crabs 
A shocking 2019 study conducted by researchers from the University of Tasmania and the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies found that over a half million hermit crabs have died from becoming trapped in plastic in the remote Cocos or Keeling Islands of the Indian Ocean and on Henderson Island in the Pacific. The researchers referred to plastic bottles and other debris as deadly traps for these animals who become stranded in discarded containers as they try navigating their natural surroundings amid plastic waste. Hermit crabs do not have a shell of their own, which means that when one of their compatriots die, they emit a chemical signal that basically says there is a shell available, attracting more crabs who fall into the containers and die, who then send out more signals that say there are more shells available, explained Dr. Alex Bond from London's Natural History Museum, who participated in the study. Essentially, it is this gruesome chain reaction. One to two hermit crabs per meter squared were trapped by plastic debris, according to a survey of the area that was conducted as part of the study. As a result, 508,000 of the crustaceans were killed. On a global scale, the loss of hermit crabs stands to severely impact ecosystems, jeopardizing the overall health of their natural environments and everything within them. Fishing Net Entanglement While it's usually best to leave wildlife alone, sometimes they need a helping hand in order to survive. In many cases, netting becomes tangled around seals and other animals' necks, posing a life-threatening risk to the creatures that warrants human intervention. Which is ironic since we caused the problem in the first place. Nod Dreyer, a kayaker who lives in Namibia, has rescued over 600 wild seals from discarded plastic and fishing nets. GoPro footage that went viral in May 2019 shows the man chasing panicked seals along the beach at Pelican Point in Walvis Bay and freeing the terrified animals from plastic once he catches up to them. Dreyer devotes much of his time to rescuing stranded and distressed seals who are caught up in plastic pollution, cutting the plastic from the animals and freeing them back into the ocean. Sometimes the injuries are very severe. The video footage of Dreyer saving seals shows how fishing nets can cut right through their skin. This is a gill net, the man said, holding up a piece of plastic he had just released a seal from. This is completely illegal in Namibia. It catches anything. Turtles, fish, dolphins, he continued, anything that swims through here will die. Entanglement is one of the primary ways plastic pollution harms wildlife. Its effects are often fatal, but are detrimental at the very least, and can harm an animal's ability to reproduce, escape predators, sense hunger, and digest food, and it also impairs their movement. Fishing nets and equipment are especially dangerous, with 640,000 tons of these materials ending up in the ocean every year. Slow Suffering Plastic harms marine life in ways that often involve slow, drawn-out suffering. Take for example a poor beagle shark named Destiny, who became tangled in a plastic ring as a baby. She grew to 7 feet long with the ring stuck around her, cutting into her flesh the entire time. In fact, the plastic nearly sliced Destiny in half and it probably would have if marine scientist James Sulikowski had not spotted her off the coast of Maine in July 2019. Sulikowski and his colleagues diligently cut the ring off Destiny, who is still growing and will reach up to 11 feet by adulthood. As she grew, it began to cut through her skin into her muscles, Sulikowski wrote in a Facebook post. If we had not removed it, she surely would have died. The team tagged and released Destiny so they could track her progress and whereabouts. Before long, they received good news. Destiny was actively traveling like a shark of her species should and appeared to be recovering from her horrifying injury. Clinging to Trash While leading an expedition in Borneo in 2017, photographer and diver Justin Hoffman accompanied a small group who decided to go snorkeling near the town of Sumbawa Besar. Roughly an hour after entering the water, Hoffman's friend, Richard White, spotted a tiny seahorse drifting near the surface amid the changing tide. The men watched as the seahorse grasped at objects passing by with its tail, which is a customary practice for these creatures as they drift along ocean currents. They noticed plastic and other trash floating by, and at some point the seahorse grasped onto a floating Q-tip. Hoffman captured a heartbreaking image, which serves as a testament to the extent of plastic pollution's harmful effects. It's a photo that I wish didn't exist, but now that it does, I want everyone to see it," Hoffman wrote on Instagram. What started as an opportunity to photograph a cute little seahorse turned into one of frustration and sadness as the incoming tide brought with it countless pieces of trash and sewage. This photo serves as an allegory for the current and future state of our oceans. Pushing Endangered Species to the Brink Last year, researchers studied the effects of plastic pollution on manta rays and whale sharks in the waters off Indonesia the world's second largest contributor to ocean plastics. 
For a little over two years, the team took water samples from an area where these animals commonly feed. They simulated how manta rays and whale sharks feed by slowly dragging a fine mesh net through the waters and seeing what they collected. Their findings were nothing short of alarming. The researchers calculated that during the wet season, these creatures consume as many as 63 pieces of plastic per hour, and during the dry season, they ingest around 4 pieces per hour. Local scuba divers assisted the investigation by searching the water for and collecting manta ray fecal and vomit samples. Out of the samples the researchers collected, the feces contained 26 pieces of plastic, and the vomit contained 66 pieces. Research of other marine species shows that plastic can interfere with an animal's endocrine system, affecting reproduction, according to study co-author Elitza Germanov, who spoke with Gizmodo on the matter. As threatened species, neither manta rays nor whale sharks can afford to have any dips in reproductive rates, she said. Unfortunately, these are just two examples of threatened species that are becoming increasingly endangered at the hands of plastic pollution. Seabirds are eating plastic. Animals that live underwater are not the only marine species suffering from the ill effects of plastic pollution. Seabirds are particularly hard hit by this problem, as the 2015 study shows. The research, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, revealed that around 90% of the world's marine avian species consume plastic. Even more alarmingly, if things continue along their current trajectory, all the planet seabirds will be eating plastic by 2050. As shocking as the statistics are, they're unfortunately nothing new to the scientists who have been tracking the plastic ingestion of birds for decades. Only 5% of marine birds ate plastic back in 1960, but within 20 years, around 80% of these creatures were consuming plastic. The numbers rose dramatically and continue to do so today. Essentially, the number of species and number of individuals within species that you find plastic in is going up fairly rapidly by a couple percent every year, research scientist Chris Wilcox told National Geographic. There is an obvious correlation between the rise in birds eating plastic and the increasing plastic production throughout the world, the latter of which doubles every 11 years, according to Wilcox. The problem is that it's worse in places where coastlines are near loosely concentrated collections of plastic, such as southern Australia, South Africa, and South America. Researchers are still learning about the destructive impacts that plastics have on birds' health, but what they've observed so far is highly concerning. For example, sharp objects can puncture their internal organs, and birds who ingest large amounts of plastic suffer from obstructions that prevent them from eating and digesting enough food, putting their well-being in severe jeopardy. Meanwhile, seabird populations are declining for numerous reasons, reminding us that while plastic isn't the only factor, it certainly compounds the problems associated with their decreasing numbers. Why do animals eat plastic? After learning how harmful eating plastic is to marine creatures, you may wonder why they do it. After all, don't they realize that it's unnatural? Wouldn't something about plastic, perhaps its taste or texture, alert an animal to the seemingly obvious fact that it's not food? The short answer to that is no. Simply put, many marine species do not have the ability to discriminate between appropriate food sources and objects that could harm or kill them. For example, a plastic bag looks just like a jellyfish floating around to a sea turtle. Plastic may look or smell like the foods that some animals are used to eating, causing them to unsuspectingly consume it. For example, plastic debris serves as an ideal breeding ground for algae that krill feed on. Krill are a major food source for many marine animals, and when they digest these algae, they emit a distinct odor that seabirds have learned to look out for while on the hunt. A 2016 study showed that the buildup of algae on plastic waste deceptively leads seabirds to consume these harmful items. But this reasoning doesn't explain why some creatures, like whales, consume plastic in massive amounts, and scientists are admittedly trying to get to the bottom of the mystery. One possible factor is the sheer volume of plastic that is dumped into the world's oceans each year, approximately 18 billion pounds. In other words, there's so much of it in the water, animals are bound to eat some of it. Another possibility is the fact that the sound of plastic rustling around and floating throughout the ocean may register it as a food source among creatures that rely on echolocation to find prey, such as toothed whales. The bottom line is that for one reason or another, or perhaps numerous reasons, many animals eat plastic because they simply don't know any better. And this is not a reflection of their shortcomings, but of ours as humans, for continuing to flood our world's waterways with trash with a full awareness of its impact on precious marine species. The dangers of microplastic. Microplastics are plastics that break down into very small particles, and while they're less visible than the heaps of garbage that collect along a shoreline, they're no less damaging to marine life. In fact, 
Recent research suggests that the abundance of microplastics in the world's oceans has likely been vastly underestimated for a number of years. The new study, which was conducted using extremely fine mesh nets, showed that the number of microplastics in the ocean may be double what scientists previously thought. Microplastics are particularly harmful because they are around the same size as zooplankton, which serve as a common food source for many species. In some areas, microplastics even outnumber zooplankton. Some creatures who feed on zooplankton ingest hundreds of microplastic particles daily, and this type of pollution has pervaded practically every corner of the globe, leaving no marine animals immune to its effects. Researchers are still trying to determine the extent of the damage. Thanks for watching! Sadly, there are countless stories about the damage that plastic causes to animals and the environment. To make a difference, check out organizations such as Oceana and the Ocean Conservancy. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and be sure to subscribe! See you next time! Bye!